Hey guys, what's up? Today I'd like to talk to you about analysis of covariance, or short ENCOVA. Throughout this video, I'll be using neuropsychological examples to illustrate some of the concepts. We'll start by going over the terminology, talk about how to control for covariance methodologically as well as statistically, how to run and interpret an ENCOVA and all of its assumptions, and we'll conclude by talking about some common misconceptions underlying ENCOVA. Once upon a time, there was a researcher, and she ran into some trouble while conducting an experiment because of a covariate which was uncontrolled for. This covariate wreaked havoc on the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable, because it clouded the interpretation of their relationship. Now you may wonder, what is a covariate? And how do we prevent it from biasing our results? In science, our primary goal is to establish a relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable such that the dependent variable actually is dependent on the independent variable. A covariate is a continuous variable, which is not part of the experimental manipulation, but still has an effect on the dependent variable, neuropsychological test performance, for example. This makes it difficult to draw inferences from our data. Keep in mind that nothing exists in a vacuum. In clinical practice, many confounding factors can influence test interpretation, such as fatigue, motivation, age, or education. Especially age and education are commonly associated with neuropsychological test performance. Patients with advanced degrees outperform those who only completed fifth grade, for example. However, as clinicians, we must decide which variables are significant and which ones are inconsequential to the patient's current complaints. If our goal is to compare groups, we must ensure that these do not differ on a host of potential confounding variables. There are two approaches to control. One is methodological and the other one is statistical. The methodological approach refers to the method or design through which participants are randomly selected or assigned to conditions and to different tests and procedures that are used. Exclusion criteria should be in place to exclude participants who are likely to affect test performance. One can eliminate these, leading to a more homogeneous sample and thereby reduce noise. Unfortunately, by doing this, we sacrifice external validity, that is, the extent to which our results are generalizable to the real world, for internal validity the extent to which our results are accurate reflections of what was measured. This is also not desirable, because in the real world, you'll hardly meet any person without medical, psychiatric, or other life circumstance that could influence test performance. You can also exert methodological control by stratifying your sample by, for example, age or sex, and then running analyses on these subgroups. However, this requires a large sample size and it is not often done in practice. You can also use cutoffs for inclusion or exclusion. For example, if you are interested in studying giftedness, you could decide to only take a sample of participants with an IQ of over 130. Another approach to control is statistical control. If a covariate can be measured, then it is possible to control for the influence it has on the outcome variable by including it in the regression model and partialing out its effect. Controlling statistically takes into account the inevitability of sample characteristics that could not be factored out by design. Groups may differ on a host of potential confounding variables, including age, education, intelligence, or depression, and it is often difficult to compare groups unless the influence of these variables is partialed out from the analysis. Let's look at the partitioning of variance graphically, first in an ANOVA pie, followed by an ANCOVA pie. ANCOVA is basically an extension of ANOVA and examines whether mean differences on an adjusted dependent variable, so adjusted for the covariate, are due to chance. In other words, it looks at the mean difference when one or more covariates are partial out from the dependent variable. Under ANOVA, you can see a pie diagram which overall shows the mean squared total variance in the analysis. The blue portion is the variance due to treatment, also called between groups variation. The orange and the pink together comprise the within group variance or error variance. 
Next, look at the variance distribution in the ANCOVA, where the covariate is taken into the analysis and its effect is partialed out. ANCOVA basically removes a pink portion of error variance and makes the variance of the treatment become larger. This yields a larger F-score and one is more likely to reject the null hypothesis and detect an effect due to increased power to detect such an effect. The more one can shrink the error variance, the more likely one is to see the true effect have a large F-value and the more likely it is that one is able to reject the null hypothesis. There are two main reasons to include covariates in the analysis. One is to reduce error variance. In an ANCOVA, we aim to compare the amount of variance in the data that can be explained versus the amount of variance that cannot be explained, or the error variance. The less error there is, the more likely one is to detect a treatment effect. Another reason to include covariates in the analysis is to eliminate confounds, so variables other than the experimental manipulation that can influence the outcome. If any are known and measured, ANCOVA can reduce bias that would occur if these variables were uncontrolled for. In experimental designs, systematic differences are dealt with by random assignment of subjects to groups. Bias due to the outside variables is the same for all groups, and we can assume that any differences between groups are due to the manipulation. Here, the main reason to use ANCOVA is error reduction. Especially if group sizes are small, chance differences are larger. While it is controversial to use ANCOVA in cases of non-randomized assignment, not all study designs allow for this. Often in clinical settings, random assignment is just not feasible because you can't randomly induce tumors or Alzheimer's disease in people. When such pre-existing classification is used, systematic differences between groups may arise which are partially reflected in the covariate. Any differences between groups can either be due to the manipulation or to initial differences between groups. In this case, when using covariates, you can reduce systematic bias by adjusting post-test scores for initial pre-test group differences. It's as though groups started out equal on the covariates. Let's look at a fictional example and actually run and interpret an ANCOVA. Let's say we are interested in the neuropsychological test performance of two different groups. Patients with lesions either due to a traumatic brain injury or a tumor resection. We are going to use education as a covariate. First, we run a univariate ANOVA and check for differences between groups. We test whether population means are equal without taking into account potential biases, so the initial differences. Here we can see that our analysis failed to find a significant effect between groups on neuropsychological test performance and that although this effect is not significant, it is medium-large. To have an effect, the covariate should be correlated with the dependent variable, but not be of theoretical interest to the research question. Otherwise, one could have just included it as a predictor in the analysis. In this case, the covariate education and the outcome variable of neuropsychological test performance are correlated, and we can include it in the analysis. When running the ANCOVA, including education as a covariate, it turns out that education is a significant predictor of the dependent variable, and its inclusion now renders the relationship between group membership and outcome variable significant. Now we are able to detect the difference between the two groups on neuropsychological test performance, which we were not before. Why that is the case, I'll explain next. When looking back at the two outputs, we can see that the inclusion of the covariate in the analysis tremendously reduced our error variance, from approximately 124 mean squares to a mere 48, and that a significant effect between groups was thus detected. The result of correcting means describes how the data might have been if education were comparable across groups. If both groups had received the same education, the tumor resection group would score higher on neuropsychological test performance than the traumatic brain injury group. Because the covariate was uncontrolled for, it appeared as though groups performed similar. Note that the total variance has not changed. All that has changed is the partitioning of the variance and how it is explained. You can and you should also calculate effect sizes. For example, in this case, partial eta squared. 
This effect size expresses the proportion of variance not explained by other variables included in the analysis. In this case, the covariate was able to explain 61% that could not be explained by other variables. Let's talk about assumptions. ANCOVA has six of them, and three you may already know from a regular ANOVA. It is important to meet all of them in order to get accurate results and prevent incurring biases. We'll talk about each of them in turn. Data are said to be independent when there is no relationship between individual measurements. This assumption is best met by design. A normally distributed variable means that scores follow a normal distribution. The F distribution is based on a normal distribution, and so if scores do not follow it, the F test is not appropriate. Bias and inaccurate p values can result when this assumption is violated. As depicted here, you can check this assumption using histograms or PP plots, but you can also check for it using skewness or ketosis or box plots. Homogeneity of variances or homoscedasticity means that the variance and the standard deviations of the residuals are equal for each group. Since we use pooled standard deviations to estimate the spread of the residuals in each group, when the differences between standard deviations are large, a single pooled standard deviation does not accurately reflect every group and therefore produces inaccurate results. To test for this statistically, you can use Levine's test or rule of thumb which says that the largest standard deviation should be smaller than twice the smallest standard deviation. The relationship between the dependent variable and the covariate should be linear for each independent variable. You can check this assumption using a scatter plot. The problem of the covariate and the outcome variable sharing variance is common and is often misunderstood. When groups differ on the covariate, putting it in the analysis will not control for these differences. This situation mostly arises when participants are not randomly assigned to experimental conditions but are part of natural groups. When possible, use randomization, otherwise matching the groups on the covariate is a good approach. The regression lines should have equal slopes, or be parallel. In ANCOVA, we look at the overall relationship between the dependent variable and the covariate. We fit a regression line to the entire data set, ignoring which group a person belongs to. In fitting the model, we assume that the overall relationship is true for all groups of participants. If the relationship between the dependent variable and the covariate differs across groups, then the overall regression model is inaccurate because it is not representative for all groups. Homogeneity of regression slopes can be detected statistically through modeling the interaction between the dependent variable and the covariate. When this interaction is significant, the assumption is violated and the results of the analysis are unreliable, as is the case in this output. Lastly, the covariate should be measured without error. This is especially important with natural groups. There are some common misconceptions underlying ANCOVA, and no discussion of ANCOVA would be complete without the mention of Lord's paradox. Lord's paradox basically raises the issue of how appropriate it is to control for baseline measurements. This paradox arose when it was investigated whether the diet at the university dining halls had an effect on weight. Weight before and after the diet was measured for both men and women, and weight before the diet was used as a covariate. The ANCOVA revealed that the mean weight difference was insignificant, and it was concluded that diet was not conducive to losing weight. In the scatter plot, you can see the male's weight in blue and the female's weight in pink. ANCOVA asks the crucial question of whether gender is related to pre-diet weight, and this absolutely is the case. ANCOVA asks the conditional question whether groups are expected to change had they come from a population with the same baseline mean. Groups are compared with the average of the observed baseline means, which clearly is not realistic. Men and women do not have equal weights or metabolisms, and you cannot throw them together in an analysis and pretend like they do. 150 pounds may be considered little for men and a lot for women. This is an example of when it is inappropriate to use ANCOVA. To summarize what both we and our researcher learned today, we learn what a covariate is and how important it is to spend considerable thought before including one. It is best not to use more than two. If possible, control by design in as far as it is feasible without threatening external validity. 
If you statistically control for the covariate using ANCOVA, be sure to meet all assumptions to get valid results. And remember, ANCOVA is not a one-size-fits-all. Beware of the dangers when using natural groups, and if possible, use randomization. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, and if you want to see more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. The next one will be on neurofeedback. Hope to see you then!